everybody, welcome back to the next part in my guitar solo analysis YouTube series. <clears throat> this week, I'm actually going to revisit uh, a guitar player that I've already done one of these uh, guitar solo analysis for, and it's the great Nuno Betancourt from Extreme. So, I don't know why this popped in my head the other day, but I, I kind of wanted to go explore his uh, great solo on the Extreme hit, Get the Funk Out, uh, which I think is just a one of the best rock guitar solos ever played. Nuno is such a fiery player, adds so many um, just uh, amazingly innovative licks uh, within his solos that are always a great challenge to play. So I'm going to show you kind of what's going on in this solo and uh, maybe how he got some of the ideas that he did uh, in, in playing this solo and how we can kind of go about taking away maybe the intimidation factor of a solo like this, uh, which, you know, at first glance could probably scare a few people off. So let's dive over to Guitar Pro 7 here where I have a pretty decent tab up. Uh, for the tone, um, with these videos I don't really edit out um, my vocal mic, which is a little lapel mic here, just because it's not really about the tone and it's a lot of work and a lot of times I'm talking while I'm playing, so it just doesn't work for these videos. But uh, I do have a performance video up that I just did of this, and what you're hearing is I made a backing track using Superior Drummer 3 for drums, um, uh, IK Multimedia Moto Bass for uh, sort of virtual bass guitar, which is a really cool instrument. And then I used a Nuno, uh, Nuno patch that I made for a dialing in uh, a Nuno-ish tone, but this is actually not from this album though. I believe the, the song I used as a kind of a benchmark when I did this was Peacemaker Die. So it may not sound exactly like this, I'm not supposed to, but it's kind of in the vein of Nuno. Uh, and that, I'll put the link to that uh, patch up in custom tone if you guys like the sound of this. It's a pretty aggressive tone. Uh, but what you're hearing in the performance video is uh, two rhythm guitars panned left and right with this tone and then the solo. And I think it sounds pretty good. Okay, so let's dive over to Guitar Pro 7 here. And first thing I'm going to do is you'll notice that I have the rhythm guitar up. We're going to talk about, like always, I want to know what the, uh, you know, harmonic background is to what he's soloing over. So if you, if you notice right here, it says solo, and it shows some kind of major bar chords. Now, I think when I played them and what I was hearing is more just like power chords, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So what are the chords? Well, you can kind of see for the first eight bars uh, of the solo, he just basically does this type of a thing. And then repeats that, okay? So it's just a B flat power chord to a C power chord to an E flat power chord, to a G, I'm uh, sorry, to an F power chord. Okay, and that's gonna be important to sort of seeing how he plays over to that harmonically. Now, we might say, well, what key does that come from? Later on in this, let's jump ahead for a second. The second half of the solo is based over kind of a four bar cycle, which is two repeated bars. One that's based around G minor, Okay, and that's this riff. Okay, as you can hear, I just did the same measure twice in a row. So that's kind of like a, a G power chord, G minor thing. If you notice, there's a B flat in there. So that really gives it the minor tonality. Then he goes up to something with a tonal center of C. So it goes. before heading back to G. So there's two bars of that, which is really based around C, but if you notice in there, there's an E as well as an E flat. So you kind of think major or minor. Well, the E flat's almost more of a passing tone into the E note. But there's also in there, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a B flat. So it kind of gives a bit of a C seventh tonality at that part. Now when we get back to the solo, I'll have those chords written above there. So basically we're dealing with a, a B flat, a C, an E flat, and an F for the first half of the solo, and then this kind of recurring riff based around a G 
to a C7 tonality after that. Um, now you might say, well, where are the, these chords coming from? Well, if we look at the B flat, the E flat, and the F, that's just like a one, four, five chord progression from the key of B flat major, which is the relative major of G minor. So it kind of makes sense that he goes back to this kind of G minor tonality later. But the one thing is, is you're gonna notice, is he, with what he plays over top of the C chord, which should be a minor chord in the key of B flat, he actually turns it into a major. So you say, well, okay, that's a non-diatonic chord, but the interesting thing is how it ties in. If we go to the key of F major, the one, four, five would be F, B flat, and C, all major chords, right? With a G minor as well. Now the only chord that wouldn't be in there would be this E flat major chord. So it's interesting that this kind of goes between like a B flat major G minor tonality and an F major tonality-ish, leaning heavily towards the tonal centers of B flat, because it starts on that chord, and the G minor. So if we take the G minor and then express it as F major with that E note in it, it actually creates a G Dorian, which is something that, I hope that all made sense, um, which is something that Nuno actually touches on a lot. <laughs> Okay, and we'll talk about that as we go through. So now we understand where he's getting that from. Let's go back to our solo part here. Now, I found a tab online that I just made some corrections to and kind of did it the way that I do it. Now, something to keep in mind here. When I do these solos, I try and stick as close as I can to it, but when we get into this type of an area here where he's playing like 30 seconds, 64th notes, you know, I've seen Nono play this live. I've seen him play it live on DVD. I've seen him play it live in person. And, and even himself, he's never going to play this exactly the same way. At these speeds, it's more getting the outline of the, the shapes that you're doing and kind of just going for it. So am I playing it on my performance video or here exactly as Nuno did? Unlikely. Um, you know, listening to it up to speed, I don't think anybody's going to be able to really pick it out. Maybe if they slowed it down and compared them side by side, yeah. So I'm not saying that I've nailed exactly what Nuno did, but I think it's close enough that it gets the point across the solo. And that's really the point of this. It's not, you know, I'll never try to copy these things because a lot of them, it's just going to be way too difficult to even go in and figure out, even by slowing it down and hearing precisely what it did. And if Nuno's not going to play it precisely the same way every time, you know, it's probably not even necessarily meant to be, but that's just my opinion. Anyways, um, so we'll, we'll take a look. There are a couple little changes I've made throughout this just to kind of suit my ideals and whatnot and the way I played it. So I kind of altered this to correct some mistakes and I also altered it to how I just kind of performed it in the performance video, but it gets us close anyways. So let's look up here at the first measure. You'll notice it says B flat, so that's the B flat major, the B flat fifth chord. What he does, he's up in this position here with the minor pentatonic, G minor pentatonic. I just played a blues scale, which he uses also. So there's a pentatonic. Well, what's interesting here is if we take this first bend he does, it's a double stop bend. He's at the 17th fret on the third string and 18th fret on the second string. That's a really typical, you know, blues rock bend to do. And then he kind of just goes back and forth between those notes. So that's our first measure and it's slightly leading into the second measure. Well, we ask, what is he doing here? Well, if we look at this, if I bend this 17th fret up two frets to this note here, right, which is a C, I'm sorry, which is a D, <laughs> that creates a little B flat major chord. Right? So we have B flat, F, and D. So really on this B flat power chord, He's kind of bending in to create the chord he's playing over top of. And then he just kind of goes with that. And right here, where it switches to C, he just kind of stays in this G minor pentatonic, B flat major pentatonic, however you want to think of it. The one thing he does do though, and this is why I was saying it's kind of vague tonality wise, is that there's no E flat or E, which is going to be the deciding factor of whether it's a C major or a C minor chord. It really doesn't sound like that. That seems to work better 
harmonically to my ear, but I think he's just playing the power chord and then going kind of into this blues mode. Before that leads into the E flat, right? These are not difficult licks if we slow them down. They're very typical bluesy things. We want to watch our phrasing, right? He has a little triplet grouping. So we could just slow that down with whatever program we use to slow it down, get the feel for that. But that's pretty straight ahead. So the first two bars. Now he holds that bend of our F, F up to our G while he switches to the E flat chord. And then he does a really typical blues scale flurry here, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, again, this is how I've played it. I, I don't know at, at the end here if maybe he's done something slightly different in his version of it. Uh, but what he's doing here, if the, the, the G minor blues scale or the B flat major blues scale, however you want to think of it, would be this. So adding this D flat note in. And so what he does is he does this little flurry that a lot of, a really typical blues lick would be this kind of a. Almost like a Jimmy Pages type of thing maybe. Uh, but what he does instead of going to the C at the 17th fret on the third string, he goes up to the blues note. So he goes to the D flat. Now I think on the recording, he actually ends up going back there. Or maybe up there to the B flat, but I just kind of ended up there. It's the way I played it, so I kind of notated it like that. So again, here's a, we gotta be careful of the triplet feel here. One, two, three, four, one, two. He's kind of playing, as it's notated here, triplets, but it's almost like accenting this note here. Okay, so again, we could just practice kind of thinking. And whatever finger you feel comfortable with, sometimes I'll play that with my pinky. You can use your third, first and third finger. How am I picking that? I'm going down, upstroke, pull off, upstroke. Okay, so that's really just based around the G blue scale. Now this is where it gets interesting. The big tapping fling. Okay, so we go to the B flat. We then go to the C power chord. We go to the E flat. We go to the F. A lot of people when they get faced with something like here at bar 75 and these crazy tapping, especially into here where he kind of goes into almost double the speed, they get very intimidated by it. But I'm gonna make this very simple for you. All he's doing is outlining the major chords as arpeggios. It's that simple. So if we can figure out the shape, he basically repeats the same shape over each of these bars. It doesn't jump out at you when you first look at it, but let's take a look at what he's doing. So over the B flat chord, First thing, let's look at the notes he's tapping. He's up here at the 15th fret on the fourth string, 15th fret on the third string, 13th fret on the first string. It's a B flat major chord. So he's just taking. So we've outlined a B flat major. Well, guess what? over the B flat. Now, what's he tapping that down to? He's going to these notes. If I eliminate this C note, it's just a B flat major chord, right? He just adds this one color tone in, which is the second or the ninth, right? So what he taps is this little thing in triplet feel again. One, two, three, one, two, three. So 
what he's playing. It's just a B flat major chord. So how we can practice it, you know, depending on our level of ability, if we've never tapped before, you might have to sit at this part for a while. Get the whole Van Halen thing going, right? Um, maybe we can do that, but maybe we have a hard time switching strings. So we might go. Right, until that's comfortable. The big jump is the toughest one where we have to jump over to the first string. So we have this going. So if that's the tough part, you know, you can buy yourself some time just practicing hammering on that F note. Right, and then that buys you time for. Right, and then, I don't know if I'm playing this exactly like he does. Like I said, there's, there, it seems like sometimes he goes, Possibly. I'm kind of doing it as I notated it here. So. And then kind of reversing things. Okay. Does that break it down enough for you? So again, slowly. One, two, three. 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 Okay. Once we have that down, we don't realize how far we are along to getting these, all of these bars of the fast stuff done. It's all he does then when he moves to the C chord. He can take that same pattern and move it up two frets. 17, 10, 12. Okay, and all we're outlining now is a C major chord again. With that extra second or ninth in there. Now all I'm doing there is I'm tapping twice on this third string. So the whole thing then, to get the move going, okay, B flat to C major. Now, to get that move, you could even just practice doing this type of thing. your targets and your hands moving and then maybe do the first two strings. You know, until we get that move and then... Right, and practice various forms like that. Now, when he moves up to the E flat chord, well again, now he moves up to the 20th fret. And he just doubles the speed of everything. And he does an extra little tap, so it's like, again... Tapping the major triad, and then adding in that little second or ninth again. But now it's in more, as we can see, of this 32nd note with almost like a 64th note feel. Am I playing it exactly like this even? I don't really know, I don't care. I'm just gonna kinda go for this and try to hit those targets on the downbeats that I need them on, you know? What does he do next? He moves it up two more frets to the F chord. There you go. So really, we just have these patterns. Sorry, I think I blew 
was something in there. But you get the idea. If we learn... <laughs> Right? We're going to be able to... And then just move those around. And he just does a little fling at the end where I just notated a tapping really quick between the 20th and the 17th fret for that last F chord. Is that clear? I hope that helps you guys. So taking it super slow, breaking it down, but learning that in patterns and realizing how it works over the chords is gonna help us immensely, I think. Okay, that brings us over to where they get into this part where they have the... Whatever that riff is, okay, from the G, the G minor tonality. And he gets into basically a straight G Dorian type of feel now. So we have our blues, uh, our blues scale slash G minor pentatonic. By adding that E note in, we're adding the Dorian tonality to it. And that's exactly what he does here. They have it notated like this, and this is how I played it. This E note here could also be here. You could go. But whatever. I mean, however you decide to choose it. I just found it easier to pick that, I guess, on one string. Right? So our, our Dorian tonality. So over top of this, we have. And again, this is just one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, and then a quick 30 second note fling. So just thinking of playing it twice as fast with a hammer and pull off. And then a really typical kind of descending Dorian feel line. Except for the B note where he goes up really to a major third there would be the minor third, the B flat on a G minor chord. It's a really typical kind of a bluesy thing to throw in there, and it gives it more of a Mixolydian feel because we still have the flat seven from the G uh, minor or the G dominant seventh chord. If you But really, it's, it's such a passing tone that it's just a, a color note more than anything. So that whole riff is... Okay? Uh, really neat Dorian feel to it with a slight Mixolydian edge to it, okay? That's where it changes to the more the C seventh tonality. And he does this really kind of cool repetitive, almost chromatic type feel. He sticks to notes from G minor pentatonics though. So really the, the chromaticism comes in here. The F sharp note doesn't really fit anything, but it sure sounds cool, right? Almost gives that flat five feel or almost a Lydian-ish feel to it, but it... Okay, so we just take that slow again. One, two, three, four, 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 one, two, three, four. And then triplets. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Really typical uh, G minor blues, right? All right, so all of that together. Back to the, uh, that riff with over the G. And he goes back to his little bends he started with. Right? Real typical bluesy lick from G minor pentatonic. Okay, now I'm just gonna scroll this over so that, so here we are here. Then he continues that over the G with another kind of 
G blues scale, but with some chromaticism added in at the end. So he starts with very blues scale bass. Chromatics. I recently wrote a really interesting article, or I thought it was interesting anyways, I hope you guys do too, uh, for Premier Guitar Magazine, uh, talking about uh, Ian Thornley, Steve Morse, and some ideas I used on my new album, which is talking about a lot of these like chromatic uses of notes that are kind of cool. Uh, so if, if you want, go over to premierguitar.com, and, and that's up there. So, um, so this phrase again. And that's where they go back to the C7 again. And a little chromatic climb there again. So that whole thing. Okay, so really we can see based a lot around the G minor pentatonic with these color tones added in some, some uh, blue scale, some Dorian. and adding that major third in for a bit of a, a Mixolydian feel, okay? So that whole thing so far. Right, watch your timing. A lot of that is just straight uh, 16th notes, couple times he flings into double, almost like double time into 30 seconds and then into 16th note triplets, right? So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, <laughs> you know, faster, right? One, two, three, four, 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 one, two, three, four. And the final lick, again, starts off with two groups of 16th notes, four, uh, four notes at a time. And again, very much based around uh, Dorian, G Dorian, right? Even though it's over, you know, this C7th chord, right? Um, it's still that same sort of shapes and patterns we've been thinking of. So, and then a real quick kind of descending blues phrase with 16th note triplets. And again, really watch your timing, you know, always be aware of that. So it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. And that's his whole solo. So really interesting, he spends a lot of time up here in that little box pattern, but he does a lot of really interesting, cool things to, to keep it interesting and uh, add a lot of really kind of cool harmonic twists, I find. Subtle, little passing tones and whatnot over the chords that uh, he's playing, but, but very interesting stuff. So I would say the biggest challenge in this is obviously the whole... Uh however it is, right? Um, but again, like I said, if we understand what it is, you know, that he's just, he's playing major arpeggios and then tapping over top of it, we can find our targets, practice those slowly. talk about with that too if you notice I don't use like a hair tie or anything like that I'm muting with a combination of the heel of this hand these fingers as well if you notice as I'm playing this the heel of this hand is taking care of these bottom strings and this is kind of doing a light bar just muting these strings out so I can get and when I move off of this string I let the palm of this hand take care of the mutes again 
And then when I move up to there, if you notice this hand shifts down, it's muting everything else out. Ah, wrong note. So that, that's a very important part of uh, that as well. And you can practice that just by switching. The thing we don't want is to hear, you know, that when we're ringing out, right? So using this to kind of roll down over the notes we want to mute. We can do that without any crazy kind of things popping out. So what do you think, guys? Does that help? I hope I, uh, I kind of rushed through it maybe a little quick, but I hope, uh, you know, you can go back and watch it a few times if, uh, if there's anything you missed. I hope that clears it up and I hope I was accurate about everything. Sometimes I'm just doing this real quick on the fly. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed it. Go check out the performance video and let me know what you think. It was a lot of fun uh, doing it. And like I said, it's all this uh, Nuno-ish uh, preset that is available on Custom Tone. I'll have that available uh, in the link below. All right. So thank you guys again for tuning in. I'll be back soon with some more content like this and some more Helix content. Uh, please like the video, share it if you don't mind. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And uh, I'll be back soon. Ciao for now and thanks again for tuning in.